everyone to the first event of the Critical Policy Study Network. You can call it CPSN, okay? Uh, which we have a big room in the Chiang Mai University School of Public Policy platform. And today is gonna be the book talk by Hugh Miller from Florida on his recent book entitled uh, Narrative Politics in Public Policy. Uh, then after his talk, it's gonna follow by the reflections from other key critical policy scholars from different corners of the world. And of course, with different time zones as well. Okay, before we start, I would firstly ask Frank to make a short introduction about the critical policy study networks and how maybe maybe editing the the talk today. Please, Frank. Thank you, Pia Pong. Um, the critical policy studies network is uh, designed to facilitate. Um, educational purposes for young scholars, but also academics. And um, one of the goals that we have now is to set out to develop a series of videos uh, related to key concepts and critical orientations central to critical policy studies by leading scholars in the field. And we lead off, as Pia Pong mentioned, with um, Professor Hugh Miller at uh, Florida Atlantic University. And we have as discussants uh, Douglas Targeson of Trent University, Marlena Prostu of Humboldt University in Berlin, Rosanna Buza in, at the University of Brasilia, Pia Pong, and myself as um, audience and discussants. And I think with that, we can simply now turn to you. Uh, well, hello, I'd like to uh, thank you all, Doug, Frank, Maria, Rosanna, uh, for participating in this thing, much appreciated. Oh. And Pierre Pong, special thanks to you uh, for not only pulling this event together, but also oh. for hosting the current Policy uh, Studies Network website. <laughs> of course, uh, uh, shout out to your technical folks who were staying up late there in Thailand helping us out with this. Here is a, uh, you know, this thing sort of disappears, doesn't it? Here's a copy <laughs> Narrative Politics and Public Policy Legalizing Cannabis. In the, uh, in the course of writing this, I sort of thought at first that uh, I was writing a cannabis policy book, uh, but it turns out that's really not the case. The, the theoretical contribution, I think, is to uh, uh, narrative politics. I lay out a narrative politics model for uh, public, public policy. But I, I haven't been long interested in uh, cannabis policy, uh, which is, in, United States usually called marijuana policy, but uh, I think the term varies by place. Back when I was in college, we called it weed or pot. <laughs> and uh, that's sort of what got me interested in it because one guy I once uh, smoked pot with uh, uh, got arrested in Kansas. I mean, he came back, we all came back from spring break and he wasn't back. And it turns out he'd been arrested and sentenced to five years in prison. And this struck me as just insane. It cost uh, the state of Kansas $25,000 a year, approximately, at the time to put him in uh, a year, to put him in prison. They could have paid his tuition, his room and board, paid for his books. That would have been a much better investment, uh, it seemed to me. It just seemed like the whole approach was not rational. Uh, and I've, I've been scratching my head uh, ever since. And I must here acknowledge a bit of an intellectual debt to Deborah Stone for articulating the distinction between the rationality project and the goings on in the polis. Uh, and that 
I think gave me a little bit of a intellectual boost in trying to sort through uh, this stuff. Now, in, this book is definitely an interpretive uh, book. Uh, it's, you know, what I, the method that I deploy is not unlike interpreting qualitative uh, data from interviews. You know, the data for this can come from reports, briefings, congressional testimony, books, uh, any sort of thing. The narratives emerge from people's spoken words, uh, from their written words. Um, what I don't do here is what a lot of folks do in public in narrative public policy uh, research is I don't have any expectation that there's going to be a setting or characters or heroes or villains or alterity or beginning, middle, end uh, or whatever uh, structuration uh, these authors are inclined to impose on narratives. And I don't perform a Burkean cluster analysis, which is an even more detailed method of rhetorical inquiry. Uh, I do acknowledge that these structured methods can and do yield interesting and important findings. They have on many occasions, so I'm not here to uh, uh, really criticize them. I, but it's just that I'm reluctant to make presuppositions about what a narrative contains before I see the words. So in that sense, uh, I, I guess my approach is radically inductive compared to research that starts with these um, rhetorical categories. Uh, the structural feature of a policy narrative isn't its uh, literary cat category or you know style. Uh, I think it's a uh, I think it's that it the structural feature of policy narrative is that it anticipates action consequences. And I think the word for this is perlocutionary. So uh, policy narratives have perlocutionary agency, uh, which means that there are consequences intended. Uh, the other thing I should say along the lines of interpretation, that the, this narrative politics model makes explicit the social construction of policy proposals by paying close attention to the symbols, the meanings, the ideography that are packed into social, uh, um, um, that are packed into policy narratives. There is not an ontological reality out there to be discovered so much as a reality that is constructed by these narratives. And sometimes the realities that they construct conflict with one another. Another feature of this book that uh, uh, is not all that unusual uh, is that I ascribe agency to narratives. Now this has been going on since the beginning when Emery Rowe, uh, attributed agency to a budget. I mean, you can easily see how that works. A budget is like a blueprint and then everybody does what the budget tells them to do and limits their spending or enables their spending according to this uh, uh, narrative called the budget. And also Bruno Latour uh, came along and called non-human uh, actants uh, gave them agency. So I'm really not cutting loose theoretical ground on ascribing agency uh, to a narrative. Uh, I'm not saying there can't be actors who assign, who uh, exercise agency, but I think it's more illuminating to attribute agency to, uh, to policy narratives in many ways. They can do uh, some important things and it's a more parsimonious way to get at what's going on. Narratives evolve. I also sort of have a evolutionary attitude about uh, uh, narratives. I don't think that they're necessarily fixed and static forever. We can see them change. We can see them interact and adapt and we can see them maneuver uh, uh, in their political environment as the political environment shifts. Uh, they sort of compete for survival against the other policy narratives is one way to look at it. Uh, they can go, they can change over time and you know, they can even go as extinct and you can watch them ascend uh, and descend. So they evolve and they possess agency. This has advantages over say policy learning approaches. I mean, uh, you don't have to figure out whether it's the individual who's doing the learning or the group or coalition that is doing the learning. 
Uh, you don't have to face the issue of morbidity among the coalition or turnover. Uh, the narrative is the glue that holds the coalition together. Uh, and sometimes that narrative uh, must evolve in order to uh, survive. And I think that's a, uh, that, that kind of works. It helps make this whole narrative politics model click. There are some reductive moves that I should acknowledge. Uh, one of them, I sort of put some boundaries around the term discourse. I, I've, I've sort of uh, made the uh, this debate over a particular policy issue a discourse, so I can distinguish, you know, one policy debate from another. The policy narratives then compete for dominance within the discourse. So these moves, uh, I do these reductionist moves to help simplify the complexity, which I think is the researcher's job in the narrative inquiry. You know, especially the political complexity around these policy discussions. There are millions, billions, trillions of meaning units being communicated around some of these policy issues. And all of this, all this communication and miscommunication needs to be simplified. And that's the job of the narrative researcher. I see these uh, raw data around policy debates like kingdom, Kingdom's primeval soup. It's not until the fragments, the images, the symbols, et cetera, are suffused with sufficient meaning and stability that they can be analyzed and interpreted. It's not that they're fixed and all that stable because they can change, but you need to uh, have some identifiable thing thingify these narratives just a little bit. A narrative, by the way, is the smallest uh, meaning unit that I could wrap my mind around and make use of. Going down to a, a more finite level, like at the level of the sign, I would run into problems like the term drug addict. There are different connotations to the term drug, ad drug addict in the absence narrative than there are in the a uh, harm reduction narrative, for example. One has a fairly neutral view of the drug addict and, and one has a hostile view. And so since the meanings are different, depending on the narrative, uh, it made sense to uh, go with uh, narrative as my most detailed uh, meaning unit, if you will. I guess there's another feature I want to uh, mention about this narrative politics model that I use. Uh, sure, it's true that narratives can achieve their coherence through tight, rational argumentation. Uh, sometimes they can do that. Uh, but I don't, but they can also convey, and this is important and cannot be ignored, emotions and values through symbolic imagery. You know, an example I use in the book is Harry Anson was able to make cannabis illegal back in 1937 by naming it the Marijuana Tax Act, even though other more neutral names for the uh, plant were in circulation at the time. Cannabis was, indica hemp was, but Anslinger's uh, framing exploited a nativism in the United States, an anti-Mexican sentiment uh, that was going on back in the days of the Great Depression. Uh, and so he wanted to put a sort of a, a negative twist and that's how we did it. Uh, there's, there is a, a curatorial uh, I, and there's a sense in which the uh, uh, narrative researcher is a curator. Uh, it's like a museum curator. Uh, except that the objects being curated are not art objects. They're, although, the, although narratives can be works of art, they're policy narratives. Uh, and instead of displaying the objects, the narrative researcher faithfully describes them after studying the data uh, and lays them and juxtaposes them against one another. Uh, the, uh, the curator assumes an extra diegetic perspective. Uh, 
And that means, that's another way of saying uh, neutral and objective, but I don't want to use those words because I, uh, in the book, I attribute neutrality and uh, pretensions to neutrality and objectivity as uh, something that a uh, hegemonic dominant discourse wants to do to naturalize itself. Uh, but rather, I guess I use the word distanciated. It's a, it's a way of uh, staying distant from the narratives, not buying into one, one of them or another. I mean, it's not to say that that's illegal or you can't do that. Uh, but once you do that, you're sort of engaging in the debate. Uh, you're uh, in the fray, so to speak. You're not in the uh, uh, stadium looking down on the playing field. Uh, and the last thing I want to mention uh, is uh, this idea about relativism. Uh, there is a sense in, in which this book adopts a relativist perspective. And by that, I do not mean that all narratives are deemed to be equal. Indeed, I don't know how a curator could do that if there's such a measuring instrument that can actually take the measure of each narrative and then, oh my goodness, they all seem to be equal. I mean, it's an absurd uh, uh, proposition that all values or all narratives are uh, equal. My, um, I'm thinking really that even the term moral relativism is a term that's used to gaslight those who might disagree with the dominant narrative. That's the way I see it used most of the time. By relativism, what I mean, and I mean this particularly in politics, that the policy narratives one subscribes to are relative to one's interests, one's values, one's position in the culture, one's culture, one's perspective, which could be a function of race, gender, class, geography, and so on. These are all contextual uh, matters. And so one's, uh, one's um, uh, ideologies and uh, narrative subscriptions, if you will, are relative uh, to these contextual factors. So to me, this uh, idea of relativism is a simple fact of politics, uh, at least uh, politics in conditions democratic pluralism. Okay, well, let me uh, uh, stop there and uh, see if there are some things that uh, uh, anyone wants to talk about further or comment or critique um, or whatever. I would like to ask about um relationship of narratives to factual information. Um, how does new or evolving factual information affect the evolution of, uh, of a narrative? Ah, uh, yeah, well, you know, uh, facts are part of narratives because facts are word-shaped objects and we can put those into our narratives. Uh, but it's interesting to me uh, in these uh, different cannabis narratives, how different the facts that are deemed important are. I mean, one narrative will subscribe to one set of facts and another narrative will subscribe to different facts. And it's not so much, I mean, there is some interpreting different uh, facts differently. There's some of that. But what I found mostly is that different facts were deemed worthy of a citing. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, the emergence of new facts, I think uh, the way I would uh, imagine this is that uh, a narrative could adjust to uh, incorporate uh, these new facts if the, uh, if these new facts embrace or uh, further along uh, the, uh, the policy efforts of the narrative. Uh, I think that they would be very welcome. And if the new facts do not, uh, and the narrative cannot ignore them, well, there might have to be some uh, substantive adjustment to the narrative. So I, I think that's how the process would work. Does that make sense? 
that it seemed to me that you want to share some thoughts me <laughs> you say me yes <laughs> okay okay i thought somebody else might want to follow up on frank's question but uh Sure. Well, Hugh, I uh, was particularly taken by um, your attempt to find a unit of analysis, uh, working through meme and uh, sign, word, and then ending up as narrative as the unit. Uh, but of course, a unit is also a unity. Uh, so there's a need to delimit uh, a unity or a unit. Uh, and your discussion of, uh, of narrative emphasizes its dynamic, changeable uh, character. You use the term evolution, which maybe now has, has connotations which may be a little too smooth to evoke the uh, red, and, uh, red and tooth and claw uh, image of, uh, of evolution, uh, evolutionary conflict and competition. Uh, but in any case, narratives are dynamic, they have a dy dynamic tendency, they change. Um, so the question is, how do you delimit these, uh, these narratives? And you set out a number of them. Um, interesting, quite a, quite a nice chart. Let's see if I can find it here. Uh, yes, on page 54, you've got table one with, all, with the narratives all set out nicely. Um, but I, I look at two of them in particular, uh, the libertarian and the uh, social justice. Well, in many ways, the libertarian and the social justice would appear to be at odds with one another. Uh, but on the other hand, um, uh, if you look into the libertarian, it's all about justice. Liber no libertarian will say that they're doing anything other than advancing the cause of justice, the rights of the individual. Uh, so the, the, the commonality between the two uh, is, is a question of justice. It, is it possible to construct a, or is it possible that a, that a narrative, there's a mixed narrative going on, which is both has elements of, I won't say strict libertarianism, but the idea of the freedom of the individual from government oppression, and the unequal uh, application of the rules uh, which we have social justice. And my sense is that, uh, that people advocating this, and I think even the discussion, your reasons for uh, getting interested in this uh, uh, has, has a sense that somehow the rights of the individual are being violated. And at the same time, the rights of um, oppressed groups are being violated. So, that's just my wondering of whether uh, there's uh, that kind of uh, uh, tension in there. I would just, uh, as an aside, I, I looked up the origin of the uh, of the change in Canada uh, and uh, and the the discourse used by the Liberal Party uh, when it advanced a, uh, a a policy, and interestingly, it had none of these elements and none of these narratives were there. It was simply a broken system. It was particularly exactly what you said. It was not rational. Mm. And, and, and there was no, no sense of, of um, and it creates criminals. It's not cost effective. There may be a sense of harm reduction here, but basically it's not reduction of harm to individuals. It's reduction of harm to the society. So that was the motivation in Canada. But anyhow, getting back to my, my, my main question is, how do you keep these neat units separate when they're changing all the time? Uh, yeah, that's really a, a good observation. Uh, and uh, I think a couple of things. One of them is what, how do they, how, did the, how does the libertarian narrative play out in the context of cannabis policy? And uh, you know the social justice narrative. How does that play out in the context of cannabis policy? And the social justice, I think the main feature of that is the uh, disproportionate uh, arrest rate for uh, African Americans, uh, and that is its main feature. The libertarian is sort of like the idea that 
I mean, it is a freedom idea. Like I should be able to do what I want without the government uh, standing in my way. Um, now, at the same time, I don't think there's any reason why uh, these uh, narratives cannot have symbiotic relationships, like, you know, to use another evolutionary metaphor. I mean, they can form, if you will, alliances and uh, help each other along. Uh, so there, those are two. Those are two ways that um, I think about it. I mean, the the third way I think about it is that uh, you know, some, in some ways, the overlap is simply a, a feature of creating categories, and these categories are, you know, uh, in some sense, uh, arbitrary. Uh, peculiar to the mind of the person who invents them, and they could be wrong. So there, that's, that's always a, a problem of trying to create uh, a, a certain precision to thingify something in order to be able to talk about it. But it, it might also be uh, uh, sometimes uh, over uh, reification of, of it. So there's also that possibility that goes into creating a narrative category. So those are about three answers to that, I think. So the units are not necessarily entirely unified. <laughs> Doug, I'll admit it. Twist my arm. <laughs> but that's OK in the cultural world. Mm. Yeah, I think, I think everything as uh, Unity is a, basically physics. Right. Even physics has fuzzier boundaries than we'd like to admit. Right. Um, can I? Please. Yeah, Masana. Please. Please. Yes. So first of all, it's a pleasure to be part of this exciting discussion table. Uh, so uh, narrative studies, no, is in public policy is very rich, interesting, and above all, useful study path. Because I think that this lens allows us to better understand the broader game of political in motion, of politics in motion. But it's also very challenging. And I'm, think, I'm thinking of uh, students who would like to follow this path of study. They need to deal with uh, questions such as how to consider, how to explain, how to nominate, how to classify, how to defend what the narrative analyst in public policy does. And uh, to, to help them, uh, uh, we could perhaps think to, to deepen three important points uh, of this path of studies, uh, which you represent in an impeccable way. And for me, uh, these points are, uh, the first is the epistemological implications of assuming narrative as the minimal unit of analysis, something like uh, Doug uh, has uh, said. Mm, the other one is the theological implication of the analyst within the curatorial method. And the third one, the third point is the interpretative implications of subscribing to narratives. And so for the first point, you know, uh, the epistemological implications of assuming narratives as a minimum unity of analysis, I think that narrative is a lens you know, that allow us to interpretatively understand public policies. But there are other lens too, you know, among which we can see, uh, for example, arguments, emotions, values, discourse. And uh, <clears throat> what, uh, but what makes the narrative lens unique for you? Could you help us to understand and to explain this for students in a simple language, please? What and make, perhaps- sorry, Regina, what makes the narrative, what? What makes the narrative lenses unique? unique, no, different from other, uh, the other ones, different from arguments, for example, or for emotions or from, from values, because each one are like, works like uh, cognitive lenses, no? And, uh, and so why when students could, for example, um, prefer narrative lenses than uh, argument, uh, argument lenses? 
for example. No, this is 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 my my question. Per personally, in addition uh, to what you said, uh, I I would like to bring to the debate at least one more aspect for narrative uh, uh, studies or narrative lenses. Uh, through uh, narration, you can better understand, for me, the patterns of interpretation and action in, large, in the large game of politics, no? uh, particularly through the idea that you, you bring to us of a percolutionary uh, agents. No, and so uh, narrative would maybe function uh, as an agent for the internal construction of meaning, but also as an agent for producing the percolutional effects of persuade, persuading, of convincing, frightening, clarifying, et cetera, et cetera, inspiring, or somehow affecting the interlocutor. Now, in this case, I think that agents is, is a little bit more than what uh, Latour uh, has defended uh, because uh, it is situated in your case it's situated on a discursive plan in motion no uh, for Latou is a little bit more static I think in my my lecture so this is my my first uh, question maybe I could put the other two because if not I will be so so long yeah well you know I uh, I remember uh, reading uh, Fisher and Forrester, uh, this chapter about argumentation, and I thought, wow, wow, this is finally getting, we're finally getting public policy into, uh, uh, you know, right into the meat of the matter. What are these arguments going on? Hmm. Um, and for me, uh, I mean, over time, I'm thinking, yeah, this is, uh, this is a, a really great philosophically informed way of looking at it. But also, you know, uh, you know what? You just have to admit, oh, uh, this is not how they do things. The politicians uh, respond to different cues. And it's like, yes, they respond to these uh, uh, emotion evoking symbolic thing, things. I mean, even uh, uh, Frank Fisher, I mean, more recently, has recognized the role that feelings play uh, in uh, alongside policy arguments, and so, um, so it. But I, I do see it. I do see a narrative uh, as functioning in a very similar way to a policy argument, except that it, there's a more material that is brought in to the narrative. Uh, it doesn't. It, a narrative doesn't necessarily have to be logical, but I, it does, I think, have to be coherent somehow, meaning that the uh, symbols and images cohere in a way that if you have this kind of a, you know, attitude that the drug addict is a criminal, then you're going to be uh, you're sub going to sub more subscribe to the narrative that puts this person in prison. And so I don't think that's logical myself, but it's certainly a coherent narrative, a coherent way of understanding things. And uh, I, can, uh, I, can, I can see that uh, making sense to people of, uh, of it, that have that orientation. Um, now, uh, what are the implications of these narratives? I mean, all right, so you go through all the work and you find out that uh, this, is, this, uh, this narrative sort of has these symbols, these ideologies, these predispositions, this one competes and has, a, has different ones, and maybe there's a little bit of overlap between one of them and a third narrative. So what do you get? Well, I think what you get is a, um, you clarified, the politics. I mean, in these, the politics, like uh, at time of policy implementation, we don't know uh, what's going on at policy implementation because there's so much complexity and this helps sort through it. I mean, even, we don't even know if a policy has succeeded or failed. Policy success is actually a social construction and the ones who want it to succeed are going to frame it that way. Uh, unless it, they can get more money for the policy if they frame it as a failure. 
but you know, I was thinking about this back in now uh, when I was, I haven't gone back and reread it and I don't, I'm sort of uh, um, shooting from the hip on this one, but you know, Woldowski and Crestman talked about policy failure. And I'm just not so sure about that. Remember, this jobs program that they were working on was to hire the hardcore unemployed in Oakland. And these days in the United States, uh, there's much more willingness to discuss racism uh, and race uh, in uh, the public discourse in general. Uh, and maybe there's something about the local employers in o Oakland really didn't want to hire hardcore unemployed black people. I mean, that's a possibility. But the whole thing, the, whole, the, but the project was framed and constructed as a government failure. And uh, uh, what's the name? Eugene Bar uh, Back Barclay Backrack came up and, you know, basically did a more broad condemnation of the capacity of um, representative government to carry out successful public policy. So the, you know, how these things get framed uh, are, uh, you know, have wide implications. Now, one thing that we usually try to do, I mean, even with, even, I, I mean, I do this to some extent in the, in the book. It's like, you know, you think of the winning policy narrative is the policy narrative that gets enacted uh, as if that's the end of the game. But it's really not the end of the game. Um, it's uh, I was doing some research uh, after the book on uh, needle exchange implementation and narratives around that, and needle exchange programs uh, have in fact been dismantled once they were set up. Once people in the in the neighborhood decided they didn't want these needle exchange programs around, so uh, the politics doesn't end at the implementation stage, it goes on and on. Um, and uh, so I think that there is this sort of, I don't know, I guess it's a, there's a sort of a need for closure about what the winning narrative is, but sometimes these narratives go on and on and don't last. So I think it's uh, basically revealing of the contours and uh, clarifying uh, the terms of the debate uh, is the function of narrative analysis. Uh, first and foremost. Um, yeah, and uh, sorting out the political contest as well is, is the, the thing that happens. I don't know if that got at your uh, question, Rosanna. I think so. There's... Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, as we uh, agree from the beginning that we don't want to make yeah. this uh, too long. So Maria, please. Yes, okay. Uh, I, I think my questions are less sophisticated and I, I hope the answers will can be short. Uh, first question is that um, on the one hand, we, we have this argument that, uh, um, that narratives, uh, they have a timeline. And on the other hand, uh, if I understood it correctly, on the other hand, narratives survive. For example, we have uh, in this nice table uh, that Doc also uh, mentioned, we have this, this nativism uh, narrative in the cannabis policy discourse, which might have un undergone, but still we have specific actors, I don't know, like the police who might act according to this um, narrative. And this is my first question. And the second question is, what is your experience um, uh, with regard to this, uh, this emotional, uh, what you, you, you said that uh, narratives carry emotions and uh, values. So what is your experience, for, for example, in this cannabis uh, discourse? Do you think that the more emotional and the more value Latin uh, a narrative is the more persuasive and the more dominant? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, uh, Harry Hanslinger back in the 1930s uh, was a big supporter of these uh, movies 
uh, like Reefer Madness and wrote a thing in Reader's Digest about uh, uh, the, the killer weed and uh, uh, manufactured highly emotional lies about this 21-year-old kid from uh, uh, Tampa in the Ybor City section who killed his parents and his siblings with an ax. And this was all, this was all, you know, upsetting imagery. Uh, it turns out to be all uh, untrue uh, that it was uh, related to cannabis. I mean, they ended up taking the kid uh, uh, to a mental institution. He was never actually put on trial. So we really never know for sure. But it was like this use of these highly charged emotional images uh, helped uh, Henry Anslinger get his policy agenda uh, enacted. Uh, and that's, that's where, uh, that's what I see, uh, that's why I see we've got to bring these uh, imagery and emotions and values into it. Now, uh, this, um, this idea of the, uh, did the police subscribe to the narrative? It's very interesting because, uh, 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 I would in this uh, in this needle exchange research, uh, we found that um, the winning narrative was clearly the harm reduction narrative. Uh, we're going to reduce the harm to the community. We're going to reduce, uh, you know, syringe needles laying around in schools and public parks, uh, and uh, we're going to have this needle exchange program where they can. Uh, where these people who use illegal drugs can nonetheless bring their uh, bring their used syringes back, so they don't pass around more AIDS and disease and so on. And uh, and yet, even after all that happened, the uh, some of the and, more, and the police chief uh, and the senior executives in the Miami Police Department were all on board with that, but there were some cops who simply were not. And of course, they could bust someone uh, for possession of uh, drugs, uh, even if they had a needle exchange card, which is a, sort of a long story. But they were not on board with the narrative. They, there, was, there was a faction, at least a small faction, maybe just a handful of cops. I don't know. But there was a sentiment that, no, we don't go for this. We don't. We're, we're still back on the absence narrative. They should just stop using drugs. These drug addicts are a nuisance to society and we're not gonna stop arresting them. And they were, you know, they were of course within their rights to do that. Uh, and so there is that, uh, you know, even after, even after enactment, there were still people who weren't signed on to that particular narrative and potentially could have uh, undermined it. Uh, uh, that's not what uh, turned out in this case, uh, and in a sense, uh, the end the end never is ending because the uh, the the needle exchange has now gone uh, statewide, but it's not as well received in other parts of Florida as it was in Miami. Right. Before you ending the session, I just want to hear from you, uh, Hugh. I want to hear your reflection on the popular narrative policy analysis proposed by Michael Jones. He called his model as narrative policy framework. I want to hear from you, what is the limitation of that framework and how different you, you make? Okay, I guess the first thing that jumps out at me is this brag that we, we want to be clear enough to be wrong you know, that something can be disproved. And I think that that's an interesting little uh, rhetorical twist there because they can, they can use uh, positivist research math methods and show which narrative is right and which narrative is wrong. And I'm thinking, you know, when I was talking about the extra diegetic perspective of the curator, once you get in there and declare one of the narratives to be wrong, you are no longer in an extra diegetic position. You are taking sides. You are on the playing field now making a case 
using empirical data or whatever you have on behalf or against one narrative or another. And uh, I don't think that there's anything sinful or illegal about that, uh, but it seems to me that it doesn't uh, properly disengage from the narratives and they don't realize that putting, providing objective data to prove one narrative right or wrong is really not persuasive. It's, uh, it, it's the, I mean, this, is, this sort of gets back to Frank's original question about facts. I mean, uh, each narrative uses facts in a particular way. And I don't think that there's a way to use, uh, you know, my superior uh, positivist research facts uh, are going to always trump uh, your measly interpreted facts. <laughs> you know, there's sort of the uh, insinuation of that. I mean, there are some other uh, problems. I mean, they've, they've made a lot of great contributions, so I don't really begrudge them all their hard work uh, and dedication. And uh, man, they uh, uh, they ha they have uh, formed a real uh, research uh, group that uh, uh, produces a lot. But I think there's something epistemologically incoherent about a social constructivist positivist approach. It's uh, I mean, I don't, I mean, consistency is the hobgoblin of little mind of, uh, but um, there's something, um, there's something <clears throat> unworkable uh, epistemologically about their reliance on uh, uh, positivism, positivistic approaches for what I think yeah. is inherently interpretive. Uh, I mean, in your own, exercise. in your own terms, they have they failed to see that the narrative is about meaning. They completely miss the point of a yeah. narrative, right. and therefore they don't, can't really understand it. I would like to come back, uh, if I may, to um, uh, earlier points that uh, Rosanna made. Um, I actually think that it, the relationship between the argument and the narrative is. Uh, more complicated or or at least requires more attention because policymakers don't sit around and say they make an argument and this poses then the question of the relation of the argument to the narrative uh, I don't think the same thing and I think um, what the narrative is is the foundational material from which an argument is drawn whether or not it's specified or not. Arguments have, uh, are based on ideas and meanings, and these are lodged in the narratives. Struggling with this in my post-truth book, and we actually talked about this, um, I discovered that in the field of, um, of communication, that they have the concept of a narrative argument. And that is that arguments are built into narratives. I mean, technically speaking, you could say a story is just a description of what happened, right? But the story doesn't necessarily say what should be done. Um, I could say that um, uh, the system is broken, but this there could be half a dozen ways to fix it. And so I have to take a position and I suggest this becomes, I make an argument about how we should um, orient ourselves to this broken system. In other words, what we should, uh, what we should do. So I, I think that narratives are built our arguments are built into narratives, sometimes explicitly, and sometimes much more subtly, implicitly. I don't, I pretend not to be telling, giving, making an argument, but I tell the narrative in a way that points to certain conclusions. In other words, um, yes, that uh, a certain course of action would appear to simply jump out, that otherwise I'd be making as an argument. It could be a subtler way actually to make my point. 
But I don't think we can uh, write off arguments because uh, in just the jargon and the practice of, um, of uh, political struggle, parties and politicians, uh, they offer arguments. And uh, they don't, they, they retreat to narratives to justify their arguments, in my view. Okay, well, you're not gonna get much of an argument from me on that one, Frank. Uh, I don't know oh. that, although I don't know for sure if narratives are a retreat, uh, but I- think I, didn't mean that, I didn't mean to define them that way, but one could retreat, uh, say, say, well, I say, why you make this argument? Why do you say this? And I have to give you some material, right? And I will take this material from a narrative that I believe in. Right. I believe the story that's fundamental, but I can't just stand up and tell you a story. I have to tell you then what right. I think it means. And you will say, why does this? And then I have to argue with you. Right. And I think the, I think Doug's example of how uh, the policy uh, debate played out in Canada over cannabis is sort of like that. I think that he was, I think Doug was sort of recognizing the arguments that were put forth. Um, okay, uh, Pia Pong, if I will, I want to, I want to mention one little troubling thing uh, about a limitation of this approach. Um, yes, please. And that is that uh, I found that it takes you only so far. I mean, there's a certain, there's a certain aspect of resources, money, interest, wealth that can actually fuel a narrative uh, or an argument as far as that goes. And so I think there needs to be a little added something. Uh, I don't think, uh, uh, the narrative politics model can do it all itself. It needs a critical theory component. There needs to be some kind of a, an additional critical take to see past sometimes what the narratives are saying. People may be, uh, people may be lying. People may be um, you know, misrepresenting and may be providing misinformation. And it takes a little bit of a critical um, attitude to be able to see through some of that. So it can't all be just taken literally, I guess, is uh, my, my last thing in the way of uh, limitations to the uh, narrative politics model standing alone. Okay, I think we spent lovely an hour already. Uh, Doc, uh, could you uh, help us to make some remark and end the session? Me? Yes, please. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, I didn't, didn't want to take it in these directions, but I, I suppose the, the question of uh, clear enough to be wrong, I would say that, uh, that Hugh's analysis provides us with clarity enough to be wrong, uh, that the, because he attempts to make units, unified units, uh, which is an attempt to be clear which is also inescapable <laughs> as we think and do any kind of analysis. Uh, but, the, uh, but the move to very move to do that carries with it a limitation because the units are not unified. Uh, to, so if you want the critical, that's the dialectical, that, that the unity always breaks up. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and that's what the people are saying clear you know, clear enough to be wrong, don't, don't get, uh, I think. So I had a, I had a, a number of other issues, but uh, uh, they tend to be side issues. So uh, I don't think I'll get into them right now, except the one thing, two things that, uh, that you mentioned, that, that you mentioned style. I would take style to be a structural feature of a narrative and that style, uh, without the style, for example, um, well, one, one writer that I know particularly well, Raymond Chandler, uh, his style, uh, his narratives were, are incomprehensible without his style. Uh, mm -hmm. So that, uh, and particularly his similes, such as, uh, as easy to spot as a kangaroo in a dinner jacket. Uh, that style is 
is a clear is a clear style obvious that doesn't mean that styles that are not obvious aren't styles uh, the second the other thing is the question about neutrality and objectivity distanciation I think we need to get over all this stuff about neutrality being nothing and uh, objectivity being nothing uh, I think rather we need to uh, interrogate those uh, concepts more clearly I think distanciation is the route to go in that but there are other other issues having with regard to relativism I would just say that there are two other options there, particularly from Mannheim, who use relationism, and there, uh, and then there's also relationalism, which have different uh, contexts. And finally, on agency, my quarrel is with Latour. Uh, I would not deny that uh, narratives or languages have effects, but that they have agency. I think that's simply a imposition of uh, of a methodological construct uh, in a metaphysical uh, sense. Mm -hmm. mm, okay, thank you, Doug. <laughs> yeah. Okay, it seemed to me that we still have uh, a lot to discuss, but time is up. <laughs> so, Frank, would you mind to ending the session? Are you there? Oh, no, why don't you just go ahead and do that? Okay, thank you everyone for joining the, the talk today uh, to kick off the Critical Policy Study Network. I hope we could meet again soon on site. Enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye. Thank you, all. thank you all for participating. I'm very grateful for your time and energy and participation. Thank you. you you're, I found it very illuminating for what, what, what you're doing yeah. and uh, both, the, both the strengths and the limits are just show, I think, uh, the situation we're in when we do any kind of analysis. Yeah. Yes, it's really interesting and there are a lot of uh, things in common with uh, subaltern studies and the feminism studies, feminist studies. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes. See you next.